Hi guys, today we're doing the second lesson out of chapter 2. Um, it is on pages 119 through 125 in your book. It's titled, Rocks Provide a Timeline for the Earth. So we're going to be talking about how scientists find the age of a rock through rock dating. So here's our little science joke about rock dating. So rock dating is not actually the dating scene of rocks. We're going to be talking about how scientists find out the age or date of rock layers. So before we start on that, I want you to take a look at this picture of my kids and think about what you can tell me about their ages. You probably can't tell specifically exactly what their ages are, but I bet you could give me a description of their ages. Just like you could tell me about the ages of these televisions. You might not know exactly their age, but you should be able to tell me something about their age in relationship to each other. So looking back at my kids, even though you don't know their exact ages here, you should be able to say, yeah, this one, Kenan, he's probably the oldest. Aiden is the youngest, and the girl in the middle is somewhere in between. So you're just telling me their age and relationship or relative to each other, but you're not able to give me their exact age. For the televisions, same thing. You might not know the exact year that they were made, but you could probably judge that they're, this one's the newest, this one's probably the oldest, and this one again would be somewhere in between. And that's very similar to what scientists do when they're figuring out the age of rock layers. They can't always know exactly the age of the rock, but they can figure out the order that the rock was deposited in, and they get what's called a relative age. So the first term that you're going to need to know is relative age of a rock. And the relative age of rock is its age compared to other rocks. Just like we compared the age of our, my kids to each other and said this one's the oldest, this one's the youngest, this one's somewhere in between, scientists do the same thing with the rocks. They use words like this one's older, this one's younger. They're giving the age of the rock layer in relation to the things around it, not giving an exact age. So it will tell them the order that those layers were deposited in, but not necessarily exactly how long ago they happened. Now there are some ways that they can figure out an exact age. We're going to talk about that in another lesson. So how do scientists do this? Well, when you were looking at my kids, you were using some clues about them, their size, how big they are, how old they look to figure out their age in relationship to each other. And scientists have some clues that they use to figure out the age of rock layers, to figure out which one's the oldest, which one's the youngest, what order were they deposited in. So to figure out the relative age, they're going to look at the order of the rock layers. They're going to look at things that come through and disturb or mess up the rock layers, maybe cracks or faults in the rock, or things that push up, maybe magma intrudes into the rock. They might look to see if the rock is folded and bent, if there's anything that's happened to mess up those rock layers. They look at index fossils, and we'll talk a little bit later of what an index fossil is. And then also looking at the absolute age of the igneous rocks or fossils, that can help them determine the relative age of some of the rock layers. Absolute age is what I just mentioned. It's an exact age. So we'll talk about how they can get that exact age for certain things and use that to get um, an idea of the relative age for rock layers. So let's start with, I'm going to go back real quick, make sure I didn't skip anything. Okay, let's start with the first rule. We're going to talk about three rules that scientists use to figure out the relative age of rocks. Rule number one is the principle of original horizontality. I know that's a mouthful. It sounds really fancy and really sciencey. Basically, it means that it's generally accepted that when rock and layers of sediment are deposited, they're deposited in a horizontal layer. They're deposited in flat layers. And that if the layers are messed up, if they're deformed, if they're bent, if they're folded, if they're faulted, that that happened after 
the layers were deposited. So that's an assumption that we will make as we're figuring out the order of rock layers in some of our diagrams. Rule number two is called the law of superposition. Again, another big, nice, long science word. The law of superposition just says, fancy way of saying, the oldest rock is going to be on the bottom, the youngest rock is going to be on the top. So here in this layer, A would be the oldest because it was deposited on the bottom. Oops, got to go back. B would be next, C would be younger, and D would be the youngest. That just says, again, when you're looking at rock layers, the oldest is going to be on the bottom, the youngest is going to be on top in layers that have not been disturbed, that nothing's happened to fold them, to fault them, to mess them up in any way. Okay. Here's an example for the Grand Canyon. Here you can see the names of the different layers. And so here's the youngest, or excuse me, the oldest. And then as you can see by the arrow, it gets younger as you go up. Here you can see an actual picture of the Grand Canyon with each of those layers and each layer deposited on the top of the next. So the oldest is on the bottom, youngest is on the top. However, wouldn't it be nice if they stayed in those nice flat layers? But we've already talked about plate tectonics and how the plates and the crust are continually moving. So there's things that are happening that are going to disturb or mess up those nice, even, flat layers. So over time, because of those tectonic plates, you can get disturbances. You can have layers that get turned, bent, folded, broken, and those layers are called disturbed layers. Something has happened to mess them up. You can see here the layers are going at an angle. They weren't deposited at that, in that way. We said rule number one is layers get deposited in horizontal layers. And then whatever messed them up happens after. It's younger than those layers. Here's some layers that have been bent and folded. So those layers were not deposited in that way. They were deposited according to the um, law of horizontality and, hor and bleh, I can't even say it, in her, uh, her, uh, horizontal layers, and then they get bent and they get folded. Here's another example of some disturbed layers. And here's a fault. We learned when we were talking about earthquakes that faults are cracks in the Earth's crust. And so these layers were deposited horizontally, and then they have been broken or disturbed by this fault. You can even see here where this layer continues up over here. All right, so the features like faults, intrusions, anything that is affecting or cutting across the existing layers is going to help us figure out the relative age. We know that the features are younger than the rock layers. So anything that has happened to disturb those layers, whether it's a fault, a crack that has separated them, maybe it's an intrusion. Here's an intrusion of magma that is pushed into the rock and squeezed into the existing rock, we know those things are younger than the layers because the layers would have had to have been present before they could be broken or before the intrusion could push through them. So that takes us to our third and final rule, and that's the principle of cross-cutting. The principle of cross-cutting just says that any kind of geologic feature, a fault, bending, Igneous intrusions, that's magma pushing up into rock layers, those are younger than the rocks that they cut. They're younger than the rock layers that they go through. So if we were looking at this as an example, we would use, again, the law of superposition to know that C was the oldest, E was deposited next, D would have been next, layer B was then deposited, and then A actually is the youngest. It happened last as this magma pushed up through the existing layers and flattened out across here. Now, we already talked about this. So if rocks aren't horizontal, they have to be disturbed, folding, tilting. All right, I didn't realize that slide was in there. We don't really need that one. Okay. I want you to try to see if you can determine the order of these layers from oldest to youngest.
All right, so oldest is going to be E. It was deposited first. Then we had B, which pushed up through E. C was then deposited on top of that, then D, and then A. So the correct sequence that you should have put down is going to be E, B, C, D, A. Let's give another one a try. All right, try this sequence of events. See if you can put those in order. Now this time it's not labeled with letters. You're actually going to have to put the um, rock's name. So geologists have certain symbols that they use to represent different kinds of rock. So here the brick kind of rock is going to be representing limestone. These, the little dots, are sandstone. And then the last is siltstone. So I'll give you a few minutes and on your paper just jot down the sequence of events for the rock layers and the fault. This is going to be a fault right here. All right, the oldest is going to be the limestone because that's on the bottom. Next, the sandstone was deposited. Then the shale, oh, sorry, I said that was siltstone, but it is actually shale. And then the last is it was broken. Those existing layers were broken by a fault. So you can see this is going to follow our three rules. One, the layers are laid down in horizontal layers. Two, oldest is on the bottom, youngest is on the top. And the third, the principle of cross-cutting, if something breaks or intrudes or disrupts those layers, it's younger than the layers it affects. So our faulting is going to be younger than these three layers because it affects all three of those layers. All right, we have one last one to practice. Again, it looks like we're using the same layers of rock. limestone, sandstone, and shale. Okay, this time we have limestone is deposited first. It's the oldest because it's on the bottom. Sandstone is next. Shale. And then we had our layers being bent and folded. So we had tilting or folding as the youngest. Our last term that we're going to cover today is index fossils. And index fossils are fossils that are things that lived in mass numbers. They were things that there were lots of them. They lived in lots of different areas and they existed for geologically fairly short periods of time. Because there were so many of them, because they are going to be found prevalently in the fossil record, because we know the time periods that they lived, that can make them useful in figuring out the age of the rock layers that they are in and the age of the rock layers around them. So we'll be talking about index fossils a little bit more and looking at some examples of those in our next lessons. All right, that's where we're going to end for today. Thanks for listening, guys.